message like this straight cut, you motherfucker. Street Trapper. Welcome to another episode of Trapping Tuesday. Let's clap it up, y'all. Turn the mic on, turn the mic on. Hey, man, today is going to be such a phenomenal week. We got so much to talk about. I just want you to know that you could have been anywhere in the world, but you chose to be here with us. And so for that, we are truly thankful. Our goal each and every week is to inspire you. It's to influence you. And it's to give you the confidence to build wealth. Listen, this journey that we are on is not an easy journey. We need support. Right? We need uh, courageous goals but most importantly we need confidence and where does confidence come from does it come from information does it come from like minded people does it come from community I have this saying that once you change the conversation you change the compensation and then once you change the compensation we change the realization it simply means that once we change who we talk to once we change the conversations we are having and who we're having them with we can change the type of money we make I always wonder why they said if you hang around five millionaires, you'll be the sixth one. I realized that it is being in those conversations, being around those conversations, being in a proximity, being impregnated with those conversations give birth to new possibilities. Because if you're talking to five people that's talking about how to make millions, if you aren't making millions, guess what's going to happen? You will be inspired. Inspiration. Inspiration. Man, such a powerful word. To be inspired is, is magic. So when you come here, our goal is to inspire you, to influence you. It's our goal. It's our mission. We're normalizing wealth. We're being revolutionary. I want you to understand that we are challenging the system that has consistently strived 
to put you in a perpetual state of poverty. Those are some strong words. Those are some harsh words. But I want them to provoke you. I want you to get off of the lonely peninsula of poverty. Cop down. The lonely peninsula of poverty. How do we move you from that? How do we safeguard you from those old thoughts that you tell yourself often? That's what Trap and Tutors is about. I like to start off with saying this. Trapping tools is, is the fertilizer that spawns a new financial philosophy. A philosophy that gives you confidence to abort the comfort of the normalization of the financial abandonment that you've inherited. See, sometimes when it comes to building wealth, sometimes when it comes to achieving greatness, sometimes when it truly comes to making those amazing investments, because we have no familiarity with them, we often don't feel like it's attainable. What is financial abandon? What is wealth suffocation? What are those things? What do they mean? When I think about America, I think about a country that has truly become a land of milk and honey. So many great possibilities. So much potential. And when I think about milk and honey, I think about it being mentioned in the biblical sense 61 times throughout the Bible. Remember, Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt to a land of milk and honey. A land of prosperity, a land of abundance. The idea and the thought of going to somewhere other than hardship was enthusiastic. <laughs> I want you to think about the days when you had less. I want you to think about the days when you didn't know being poor was being poor when you normalized it, right? That lonely peninsula of poverty. When you were poor, the people around you were poor, so you actually thought that commodity cheese was the norm. You actually thought that the white box with the little kid with the steam coming from the green bowl was normal. Okay, I know that may not be everybody's reality, but for the people who had that reality, you thought that was normal. But maybe your reality was a little bit different. Maybe your reality wasn't that. Maybe your reality was normalizing boiling hot water and putting it in the tub. Maybe your reality was four of you all sleeping in one bed. Maybe your reality was not getting a new pair of shoes but once or twice a year. But understanding and normalizing that reality is becoming well sufficient, insufficient. How do we change that? How do we become bold enough how do we become audacious enough? How do we have the unmitigated gall to go against that? The land of milk and honey. The land of milk and honey, y'all. But I want you to think about something. There's another side to that land. There's an untold story to that land. America alone right now has given another country over $85 billion in aid. 
Now, I'm not the person to say that another country doesn't need help, but what I am saying is when you have people in your own land of milk and honey struggling to find milk or honey, how can we help someone else? How can we clean in front of someone else's door when our door is still dirty? How can we say that this is the greatest nation on earth while we be $38 trillion in debt, but yet we loan money to someone else? I'm not saying it's not the land of milk and honey. I'm just saying, are we particular? Are we biased on who can taste the milk and who can taste the honey? Welcome to Trap and Susie, y'all. Oh, huh, man, such an amazing meet. So, 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 so much to talk about. So much to discuss. I hope the energy is up. I hope we're ready to go. I need you to do me a favor. Like and share this video. Let's get the likes up. Let's get the likes up. Also, make sure Trapper Attire is present. Today's episode, tonight's episode is definitely a writer downer. Got a lot of stuff to write down. Got a lot of notes to take. But I don't want you to just be a note taker. I want you to be the person that has the notes and then uses the notes. Because if you don't lose the notes, you're wasting my time and yours. I don't like my time to be wasted. For most people, you've worked hard all day. You've had some time, and you chose to come sit here with me for the next two hours. So let's make this an asset. If you got your notes, I'm going to give you five seconds to go get your pen and your paper. Got a couple guests in the house tonight, man. Got my right hand, Lashana is in the building. What's good, queen? She's representing with her trap attire on. She has the Wall Street looks like us now, olive green. That's the go-to-wall apparel, Right? Then I got my guy Marcus in the building, Mr. Systems, Mr. Funnel. You know what I'm saying? That's a nice jacket got on too, man. Like that. You know what I'm saying? Tonight is one of those nights, man, and I love when we have guests in the house. To all my new trappers, man, welcome home. Come have a seat at the table with us because we going to cook. This is your brain. This is your brain messing with trap. Hey, man. <laughs> that boy is good. All right, all right. All right, man, so let's get into it, man. Each and every week, man, y'all know how we start. Y'all know how we get going. Let's start off with our pledge. Everybody stand up. You already know what it is. Episode 27, y'all. We here. One more gram. We got a whole quarter. Wait, stop, trap. Don't go that far. 28 grams is all I need. You don't go that far, though. People watching. We got cheering. Just came up from school. All right, let's go. Right hand over your heart, you understand? I am a certified Wall Street trapper. I am confident in my ability to make great investment decisions. The stock market is a machine that prints money, and I am more than capable of operating that machine. Not only will I free myself, but my family will eat for a lifetime based off the information that I applied today. I'm a money maker and wealth builder. Today I break all the chains that anchored me to the poverty mindset. My ancestors will smile because I have turned my last name, our last name, into an asset. My family's purchasing power will increase indefinitely. Today, I make the declaration that no longer will I be a slave to money. No longer will the generations behind me inherit lack. No longer will I submit to selling my time for money. I am a first-generation millionaire. I am the architect of my family's legacy. I am a certified Wall Street trapper, and Wall Street looks like us now. Let's go, man. Welcome, 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 welcome. Ha! <sighs> Let's get to it, y'all. That's an intense 20 minutes, if I say so, my 
myself. At least 15 minutes. All right, man, so let's start off with our word on the street. Y'all, y'all know how that go. And before we get to our word on the street, I want to ask you this simple question. What is the relationship that you have between where you are and where you want to go? I ask you that question because sometimes you are married to where you are and you flirt with where you want to go. Mm, mm, mm. You are married to where you are and you flirt with where you want to go. Where you want to go is your sneaky link. You visit us sometime. You visit him sometime. You get infatuated with the possibility and then you leave. Because you are scared to the healthy commitment. You are scared of what it will take you to go where you want to go. You are scared of the consequences of commitment. Yeah. All right, man, let's start with work. Hey, I'm telling you, tonight is one of them nights. Well, I just feel like I'm full of financial, I'm full of the financial Holy Ghost. <laughs> the financial Holy Ghost. I just got it in me. I was listening to Martin Luther King's I've Seen the Mountaintop. That is by far probably my favorite speech of all. Okay, so word on the street, let's get to it, y'all. The Dow Jones actually eked out a green day today. The S&P 500 was down today. The NASDAQ was down today. That's heavy. It's real heavy. They had something strange happen this morning. Probably like for the first two hours of the market, we saw that stocks had abnormal activity. There was a disconnect between there was a disconnect between the orders that went in and the stock market actually taking the orders. So some stocks were down 15, 20 percent. Some stocks was up 10 percent. It was all because of a miscommunication between the buyers and the sellers in the machine. I want to talk about that today because today we're going to talk about open AI. This will truly be a game changer. Think about we've gone from a, from, a, from a generation, the last two, 20 years, we have went from, just Google it, to now we may go to just AI it. That's going to be dangerous. All right, man, let's move a little further. Let's get into the show. Let's talk about the heat check. Today's heat check was 1.2. Now, y'all know I always talk about this, the calls and the puts. Remember when I told you something? I said, listen, the rally that we had in the market two weeks ago, it was a pump fake. The reason why we knew it was a pump fake was because we looked at this specific stat right here. This is called the put and call ratio. This is what it tells us. If we see the market is under 1.0, the put call ratio is under 1.0, we know that the market is bullish. If the market is over 1.0, we know the market is bearish. Now, that is surface level. The reason why I knew it was a pump fake was because even in the green market, even when the market was rallying, when we looked at the put call ratio, we saw that they only had about 50,000 more calls than puts. Well, trap, well, that, that the market could be changing. The market could be, that told me that it was news. That told me that there was information, information that made the market run. It did not show me a sign that the sellers had switched sides. You had as many sellers as many, as many buyers on the day that the market was running. So when we looked at the put call ratio, we said, hey, that's a pump fake. Because there's 29 million sellers, there's 29 million and one buyers. That means it ain't that big. So today we're going to look. Today the ratio is at 1.2, 1.02. Watch this. We had 2,904,000 calls. Right? 
we had 2,956,000 puts. That means we had about 52,000 more puts in the game than calls. So what do I know? What did that tell me? That tells me that the market still is pessimistic about the future. Watch this. If I see that the market has anywhere between 200,000 and 300,000 more calls than puts on a two or three day basis, then I'll say we may be on a bear. We may be into a bull run. Mind you what I just said. When we look at the put call ratio, if we see two to 300 more calls than puts consistently, we know that the buyers, the sellers have now found optimism. Oh, this is good. I don't even think y'all understand how good this is. Right now, what we're doing is we're looking at two cars that go real fast, and we just said, pull the hood up, let me see. We just pulled the hood up. Now, this is not going to be found on your technical analysis. This is not going to be found on the balance sheet. This will be found when we look at the put and call ratio. We need to understand, watch this, y'all, this is important. The market consists of buyers and sellers, supply and demand. As long as there's an equal balance, you'll have days where some days the sellers are in, some days the buyers. It's always a fight. There will always be a fight between buyers and sellers. There's always a fight between optimism and pessimism. There's always going to be a fight. As long as we have interest rates the way they are, as long as we have supply chain issues, as long as we have the United States talk about the debt ceiling, as long as there is uncertainty in the field, there will always be a level balance. But, this is a but, the minute the market sees a clear route ahead, The minute the market sees a soft landing ahead, those sellers will convert to buyers. They will be baptized into the profits of the market. <laughs> they will be baptized by the profits of the market. They will be baptized. They will be sanctified. Lashana is about to run out of here for that word I just used. <laughs> they will be. <laughs> but when we see the calls have about 200,000 more people than puts for a two to three day consistency, that tells us that the market may be on the way to shift. Let's clap for that. All right, let's go a little further, man. So today I want to do something a little different. Normally we show y'all the heat check, I mean, but here's what I want to do, y'all. I'm going to get up a little bit. We're going to get to the board fast. Get to the board a little fast today. All right, here's what I'm going to show y'all. Today we're going to evolve a little bit more, and we're going to get into what's called the heat map. We're going to dig in a little bit more into this heat map. So Instead of us just looking at the 10 industries that's doing good, what we're going to do right now is we're going to look at where the market was green at, where the market was red at. You like this, brother? You like this? Hey, my boy, man, my guy. All right, so check this out. Apple up 1% today. Now, we in technology. Mind you, I will say this. Technology is up about 5% over the S&P right now year to date. So we're looking at the technology sector and we say, hey, Apple was up 1%. We see Microsoft down. We see Oracle down, Cisco down, CRM down, Texas Instruments, NVIDIA, Broadmoor, they down, right? But then we say the financial industry, the sector, it was pretty balanced. We got Berkshire B because they're insurance. 
Visa, MasterCard, JP Morgan, Bank of America. Understand that inside the financial industry sector, you have industry. So you got payment processes with Visa and MasterCard. You got insurance with Berkshire Hathaway. You got banking with JP Morgan. You got investment banking with Morgan Stanley. So now you see, you see different levels. I feel like Bob Breck. If you're from New Orleans, that's the weatherman. I feel like I'm doing this and I feel like, I feel like the weatherman. I feel like the weatherman right here. All right, so then right here, we go to utilities, right? Next era energy, we see them, Diamondback energy, right? We go to energy, we see Exxon Mobil fought back today because it was down early. It fought back today. We got uh, Chevron, it fought back. And then we go to consumer discretionary, right? We got Walmart, Coke, Pepsi, Procter & Gamble. This sector is the sector where people, you need that regardless. Right, but then we got consumer cyclical, right, which is Tesla, Amazon, TJ Maxx, Home Depot, Starbucks, Nike, McDonald's. These are the sectors where people spend when they got a little bit of flexible or expendable money. All right, and then we go to healthcare, right? So we just look, I'm just showing y'all. We got Johnson Johnson, Eli Lilly, Pfizer, Merck. So this is the heat map, and this tells us how the market perform, where the cold and where the hot areas at today. Hey, man. Golly, man. Golly, man. Hey, man. I feel like we on the road today. Let me know in the chat how you like that. Let me, know, let me know in the chat if you want me to bring that back next week. Let me know in the chat if you want me to bring that back next week. I need to see it right quick. If you want to bring that back next week, we'll bring it back next week. Let me know in the chat if you want me to bring it. Shout out, man, Jose. We are, Jose, we are 27 minutes in, and we hit 1,000. <laughs> hey, we getting that faster and faster every week, man. All right? So we'll bring that back. We'll bring that back, man. All right, let's go a little further. Let's go a little further, man. All right, so here's what I want you to look. I got a question. I got a question. It's a good question. Is technology and information software back like it's never left? Watch this. So far to date, semiconductors are up 12%. The communication services, which is Netflix, and is up 12%, 11%. Consumer discretionary is up 7.8%. Technology is up 5.5%. Why am I asking this question? These were the companies that were truly getting beat in 2022. My question is, is it time to Omaha, 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 is it time to call an audible? Is it time? I think it's a little early. I think it's a little early. What happened? What's wrong? We got to fix that. My mic? All right, give me a second, y'all. Two days. Do this for a second. Drop the beat a little bit. Lowball it. We having a little mic check, y'all. Give me a second. We about to fix it. Shout out to everybody in the chat. I'm going to tell y'all why we love the Travis so much. Y'all let us know we about to fix it right quick. Let's get on it right quick, fellas. Let's fix it right quick. Just give them a little bit. Hey, y'all, check this out. Two day. Let them hear that beat right quick you just made. Y'all give me about, we need about two minutes. We got y'all. We got y'all. Give me about two minutes, two day. Let me hear that beat.
Let's go, let's go, let's go. Somebody said you can't do this on CNBC. We are on CNBC. Right. CNBC ain't going to get this type of vibe. That's why we bring you here, and that's why you ain't on CNBC. That's why we got our own data team. That's why we got our own beat. That's why we got our own vibe. You know what I'm saying? You did. If CNBC was so good, why everybody ain't making money on CNBC? You feel me? You feel me? All right, man. Let's go, let's go. Tell me in the chat how y'all feel, how y'all feel, how y'all feel. All right, cool. We back in action. All right, so my question is, is, is it time, is it time for us to get back in tech? Mm, I, think there's, I think there's spaces where we could get in at. I think there's spaces. So I love information technology, but I also love cybersecurity, enterprise software. We'll get to that. All right. Question. Healthcare is down. Utilities are down. Consumer staples are down. Is it time to leave those and pivot? Remember I said something. We have to pay attention to what the market is rewarding. Now, I'm not saying it's time to exit healthcare. I'm not thinking it's time to exit utilities. But it is my job to show you what the market is rewarding. All right, let's move a little further. Let's move a little further. So because I know there's so many new investors that come to Trapping Tools each and every week, seeking guidance, seeking clarity, one of the things I want to do is show us this safe haven. ETFs are a great way for investors to find safety. It's a way for us to navigate the risk that comes with investing. So what I want you to do is pay attention to some as we invest in ETFs, and as we invest in these safer plays, here's something I want to show you. So we created this wheel. So this first one is the VT, the World Index, right? So you have your Samsung, your Nestle, your LVMH, your uh, TSMs, your Alibabas, right? Your ASMLs. But then you got VTI. So this is a World Index. So this ETF has all over the world. You can see we in China, we in LVMH, we all over the world. But then you got VTI, this is the U.S. stock market. You got the U.S. stock market, and then you got the VOO, which is the S&P 500, right? So I just give you an example. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to pay attention to specific things. So I want you to pay attention to. First, does it have, this is the check engine light. Write this down. POC, appreciate the super chat family. I want you to write this down. Check engine light. I'm gonna give you some game right here. There's some real game right here. This your check engine light. It's your check engine light. Does it have low fees? What are the fees? Expense ratio. What does it cost us? What are they charging us to invest in this fund? What are they charging us? to invest in this fund. Who wants to see that first? Next, liquidity check, volume. We want to find an ETF that has volume, meaning you want people in and out of there. You want to see that people are in it. Why is this important? Because if you buy ETF that doesn't have any volume, you have no one to sell it back to. If it don't have a lot of volume, that mean that dope ain't good. Got my bad. Damn it. <laughs> that means it's procaine. Damn, I said it again. My bad. Y'all you know I be tripping sometimes, yeah. <laughs> Next, got money. This is important. When you're looking at an ETF, you want to look at AUM. That is assets under Management. If you're the only one, if they don't have big assets under management, we want to stray away. 
How do we find out? Well, we look at what assets they under have under management, compare it to other ETFs that are similar to it. Birds of a feather flock together. Right? Lastly, who's on the team? Now, what do I mean by who's on the team? Check the top 10 holdings. Let's see what are their top 10 positions and what are the percentages that they have. Now, watch this. Last week, episode 26, we told you if you had $10,000 invested in something, we showed you how that $10,000 was broken down into the top 10 companies. We showed you that last week. I told you, every week we tell a story. Every week, one episode is connected to the episode before. It is important that you go check out episode 26 so you can understand this logic. So we're checking our engine light. How are we checking the engine light? One, does it have low fees? How much are we paying for it? Two, liquidity, checking the volume. See if they got a lot of other companies in it, a lot of investors in it. Three, money, how big? The assets do they have on the management? And four, who's on the team? We want to check who in that top ten. Golly, man. <laughs> that boy is good. Somebody online is charging you $19.97 for this that I just gave for free. And they're making a bankroll. Marcus, somebody online charged them $19.97 for that. I just gave it to him for free. Somebody. Just need to know that. All right, let's go forward, man. <laughs> Watch this. Here's a question I want to ask you. Watch this. Write this down. It's important that you see this. What is your relationship between... Watch this. What is your relationship between the expected return on an investment and the risk that you're willing to take on the investment? Let's think about that again. All right, let's think about it again. What is the relationship between the potential return on an investment and the risk you're willing to take for the investment? All right, so trap, like make that make sense to me so I can really, because I don't, I don't understand what you say when you say like, what is the, what is the relationship between the two? All right, so here's what I want you to think about all the time. For every investment you make, there's a risk you got to take to make that investment. For the risk of making the investment, you have an expected return on that investment. I want to make you better investors. I want to make you better investors. Right? I want to make you better investors. How do we do that? You become better investors by learning how to measure the risk and the return, okay? Watch this. How do we say what type of return are we making, Trap? Let's do this. This is easy. This is easy. Look at the, watch this. Damn, this is good. Damn, this is good. This is good. Trap, how do we measure that? Watch this. Watch this. What is the annual return on our investment over the last five, 10 years? One year, five year, 10 years. What is the average return that this specific investment has given me over the last one year, five year, and 10 years? Okay, watch this. One year is showing me most recent performance. Five year is giving me midterm performance. 10 year has given me a body of work. This is good. This is good. This is good. This is good. Watch this. Let's say investment has given me, watch this. Now, we know that in most cases, that short term is right now. So we're going to look and see, what have they done recently to give that return? Watch this. How much, let's say investment has given me 13% or 10% in one year. Watch this. How much am I really in the risk to get a 8% return in one year? If that's what it's giving me. Let's say it's giving me negative 10%. And I understand what's going on. How much am I willing to risk 
to say that this won't give me a negative negative 10 percent so first you're looking at one year now we should never base it based on one year if we see the one year the next thing for us to do is to go identify watch this y'all what is the catalyst that made it perform whether positive or negative what is the catalyst that has made it perform in that manner god Lee, man. Somebody charged in 1997 for this, I promise you. I promise. And I ain't talking about $19.97. Somebody trying to give you this in the middle of a two day workshop. I promise you. Somebody done put you in a five day challenge. Somebody done put you in a five day challenge based off the information they heard on Trapping Tooth. Don't fall for it. Matter of fact, I'm not hating on nobody, man. God damn. It is what it is, man. I'm not hating, man. Get your money. Y'all got to stop laughing so loud, man. Get your money. Get your money. I ain't knocking the hustle, man. Just know. At least in the challenge, say, I heard Trap say this. At least say that. At least in the challenge, send the people to Trap and Tuesday. That's all I ask. I don't even want the data. Just send them to Trap and Tuesday. All right, let's go a little further. Let's go a little further. Now, hold up, Dave. Go back to that. Go back to that. I ain't finished this yet. I'm still digging. Now, when we go to the five-year, let's ask ourselves this question. What am I willing to invest based on this five-year return? Right? So the five-year return probably give you a little more body of work. It is formed a little bit more. Right? It's formed a little bit more. Thank you for the Super Chat family. I love it. Zay, don't laugh at me, brother. Zay, don't laugh at me. That's my man, Zay. Man, I love Zay. All right, so we look at the five-year return, and we say, hey, check this out. How much am I willing to risk for this five-year return? Based on the five-year return, based on the fundamentals that I see for those five years, how much am I willing to put up to get this return? Man, this is good. This is good. This is good. And then we go to the 10-year return. So now the 10-year tells us in the last 10 years, which means now we go back to, I'm going to tell you why the 10-year return is so good. Because now we go back and look at the performance from the financial crisis and the pandemic. If you go look at a 10-year return, we get a back-end performance from the financial crisis. How did it recover? And then how did it perform during the pandemic? That 10-year return going to give us a body of all of that. So now on a 10-year return, whatever it is giving us, we say, okay, how much am I willing to invest based on this? Now, let me say this as the caveat. Past performance don't predict what's going to happen in the future. Let me say that as a, listen, let me say that. Past performance doesn't tell us what's going to happen in the future. It can give us a body of work on how a stock has recovered from a drastic financial event, evolved, moved forward, got into another economic event, and then moved on. So in a 10-year time span, so we go back to 2012, that means the stock has recovered from the financial crisis, and the stock got the ball rolling, and then it went through the pandemic. And now we're here. So we look at that 10 years, it has given us the body of work on how a company has performed based on two economic events. Yeah, that one, that, tell me that one no board, bro. That one no board. Nick, miss it. Hey, man. What is the relationship that you have between risk and expected financial return? God, that's good. I bet you CNN ain't give you that. I bet you CNBC ain't give you that. I bet you Kramer ain't give you that. Stop playing me. Stop playing me. Because if you don't listen to me, you're going to be like this. I'm in a bind, Nate. Some other time. Some other time. <laughs> I really need this money. I really need this money, Trap. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you, man. I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you. All right, man. Let's go a little further, man. So as we now will look at this, you don't want your door kicked in. You don't want your door kicked in. So moving forward, for 20, go back, Dave. 
For 2023 and moving forward, I truly believe that cybersecurity is somewhere that we need to be. As investors, as trappers, I truly believe that we need to be. Now, remember this. I want to say in episode 17, I told us something. I said, listen, hold up. Let me stop for a second. I want to tell the whole team something. Is that 16,000, 1,600? I think we have 1,600 people in the chat tonight. We just, you know, we beat our high. I think our high was at like 15. We just beat our high. Salute to that. Let's salute to that. We're going to get to 2,000, man. We're going to get to 2,000, y'all. Hey, man, do me a favor, y'all. While you in the chat, let's get the likes up. Let's get to 1,000 likes tonight, y'all. Give me a second. Let's get to 1,000 likes. Let's get to 1,000 likes. Everybody stop what you're doing. Let's just get some likes in right quick. Like it, 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 like it. Share with, just share with three people. Just share with, I'm going to just say two. Share with two. Just your auntie and your, and your side piece. That's too many. Share with the person who, if your significant other found out you was texting that person, it would be a problem. Share with that person. Share with that person. Yeah, share with that person. Because you know what that means? If you ain't getting money, you don't need to be around me. LaShana <laughs> is like, yo, that's, what, that's how we do here, LaShana. Chill. <laughs> this is for the people. I told you we grassroots over here, baby. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about this. Let's talk about this, y'all. I want y'all to understand this. I want y'all to hear me. A couple weeks ago, I told y'all something, right? I said you, I said that I like cybersecurity, and I gave y'all eight stocks to look at. Not eight stocks. I told y'all eight places to go. Defense was one. Cybersecurity was one. Healthcare was one. We'll stop right there. I doubled down on cybersecurity. Here's why. I'm going to be real with you. As we evolve, Watch this. As we evolve and as we get into more and more technology, as we get into this AI, as we keep evolving, data is the new gold. That is the new gold. That data is extremely vital to the existence of a company. Watch this. If a small company, if a small company has a data breach, it can cost that company everything. If a small company has a data breach, it can cost that company everything. If a big company has a data breach, to get it fixed, it can cost them just as much as the breach itself. So what you understand, enterprise software is essential. So whether it's uh, Fortnite, Crown Strike, Okada, I personally like Crown Strike. I think Crown Strike is the big dog. It has the most uh, customers, but you need to be. It is imperative. It is imperative that you as an investor invest in cybersecurity. Hey, I think we glitching, fam. All right, let's move forward. All right, so check this out. Microsoft 
is on the verge of doing something special. Microsoft is doing something special. So Microsoft not only bought Activision Blizzard, Azure is up, and then it just purchased OpenAI. These three things right here tell us a lot about what the CEO feels. Here's what it shows us. It shows us that the CEO believes in the cloud. It shows us that the CEO believes in gaming. And it shows us that the CEO believes in open AI. It shows us that the CEO believes in augmented reality. It shows us that the CEO believes in artificial intelligence. You can tell a lot about a company by the moves that the CEO is making. These three moves tell us where Microsoft is headed. Let's move a little further as we talk about this. This is serious. So Microsoft announces a $10 billion investment in this open AI company. Chat GPT. Now watch this. Go a little further. I really want you to pay attention to what we're about to say right here. Why is this such a big deal? Right? Why is this such a big deal? Okay, let's go a little further. Watch this. Here's a na way to navigate what can happen here. So what happens is this data is collected, watch this, by human, watch this. The data that the open AI gets is from you as a human. One of the things I tell people all the time is when you're on Facebook and you play these little games, you remember when everybody was putting, when everybody had this, remember not too long ago, a couple weeks ago, Marcus, when you saw everybody with the cartoon AI figures? That's artificial intelligence. Whatever, I didn't do it. But I'm sure you had to put some type of data in to get that. Maybe a picture, I don't know, something. Maybe just your log into your Facebook. I don't know. You had to do something. I didn't do it. But you had to do something. And when you did that, it collected your data. That's how you got the picture. It ain't just draw the picture on its own. You had to put something in. You had to give it some type of information. Log into your Facebook. Log into your YouTube. Log into, you had to answer some questions. I don't know. Tall, dog, handsome. I don't know. You had to put something in there. You had to put something in there, right? Watch this. That data and information is downloaded into somebody's software, right? It's downloaded into somebody's software. One of the reasons why I never played the games on Facebook was because of this. They give you a list of questions. You answer those questions, and then it gives you, this is how you look when you're 60. You think they care about how you look when you're 60? What they got from you was your data. You told them what you like. You told them what you don't like. That same data, watch this, is when you're on the phone and then you get off your phone, and then you get on social media, and the same thing, bro, I'm thinking about going to Chili's. You get on, the, you get on social media, here's a Chili's two for 99 ad. How that got there? They listening to you. You go search for a flight on Delta, you get on Instagram, a Delta ad pops up. You say something about stocks, Wall Street Travel pops up. <laughs> I'm following you, people. I'm following you. I need you to know this. But I'm being real with you. The more you play those games, the more you're feeding the artificial intelligence. There will come a time, and this is real soon, that's what this open AI is doing. It will give the technology the ability to have human-like conversations with you in the moment. 
I'm talking about Siri and Alexa on steroids. I'm talking about like some Terminator type stuff. Dave, I'm glitching. But I'm talking about some Terminator-like stuff here. So I just want you to be mindful. Let's go a little further. Let's go a little further. Watch this. This chat, this open AI that Microsoft just bought, Microsoft just bought, watch this. Can pass a medical licensing exam. I'm going to just keep it real with you. I probably can't pass. I can't pass one of them on the first try. I struggled passing the God dog on driving test when I came home from prison. <laughs> I was handsome. I was able to flirt my way to get my license. Man, look, I just come home, love. I'm just trying to, you know. My cousin gave me the avalanche. Shout out to my cousin Pepper. He a preacher. God was with him and me. He said, hey, look. I told my cousin, I said, hey, cuz, look, man. I got to get these licenses, bro. He said, look, ain't nobody got time to be letting you test drive. He gave me the avalanche. Got in the truck. We prayed. And then we came out. The lady said, you can't drive worse. Crap. I said, listen, check this out, man. I said, man, I just came home. You got to trust me. I need it. I just, I got a call and everything. She gave my life. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. <laughs> but listen to this, y'all. This open AI can conduct complex analysis. It can pass the U.S. medical licensing exam, y'all. It can pass the licensing exam. It can take complex analysis. Watch this. Watch this. It can write code. In case y'all don't know what code is, it's the thing that's making this YouTube work. It's the thing that makes the gaming works. It's the thing that makes everything move. Everything in technology needs code. This open AI can write code, y'all. Watch this. It is trained by internet data. At some point, we will go from being able to Google it to just asking your phone. Certain things Siri can't answer. I'm talking about this thing having a real live conversation with you like, no trap, that's not it. This is a game changer. Let's go a little further. Watch this, though. Watch this. I want you to understand something. There's jobs that this thing going to take. Dave, we got a slide with some jobs on it. It's in there. I thought it was. The number one job that OpenAI will take is, watch this, cashiers. It's the number one job it's going to take. Cashiers is the number one job it's going to take. There we go. Cashiers. Number two job, Drivers. Number three job, translators. TDJ's got it in his church right now. You put it on your ear, while he's talking in the moment, it's translating the service. While he has it, while he's preaching. <laughs> so TDJ's had this thing when he's in his moment, he say, holla at your boy. I wonder how they say that in, like, <laughs> I wonder how they say that, like, holler at your boy. I wonder how to open the eye says that. Holler at your boy. <laughs> All right, so here's another job that it's going to take. A stocking associate, meaning if you stocking goods at Walmart, they're already doing it in Amazon. They got the robot that put the stuff down. Uh, uh. Bookkeeping. Lashana, bookkeeping. 
We need some open AI bookkeeping. That's one less person on payroll. Shelly, I love you. Shelly, we love you. We love you. Cleaner. Bartender. I don't drink. That's all y'all. Waiters. Imagine this. Going to the restaurant, scanning it. They already got that part. You scan it. The thing pulls up. You place your order. It takes your order, and then it says, you'll all be ready in 15 to 20 minutes, and then the robot comes out, boom, give you your order. What do you do? What do you do? Let me say this. I'm being realistic right here. A lot of us can only do some of these jobs. Some of us are only good, you know, hard working. Hard labor is all we know. What happens when a robot takes your hard labor job? I'm not the person to tell you, leave your nine to five. What I will tell you is this. Everybody's expendable, y'all. If you do not learn a skill, I ain't just talking about carpentry. I ain't just talking about plumbing. Maybe electricians can stay around. But you're going to have to learn how to start a business. You're going to have to learn how to invest, start a business. You're going to have to learn how to do something, y'all. Because these robots is coming for your job. We just not watched. I'm not, not, watch this. Y'all know I laugh, I joke. When I'm serious, I'm serious. Over the last six to eight months, we've watched some of the biggest technology companies in the world cut 10,000, 5,000, 8,000, 6,000, 11,000. People like Ford, 10,000, Spotify, 10,000. Half of those jobs not coming back. They ain't coming back. Because by the time we get on the other side of this recession, by the time we get on the other side of this bad economic downturn, they will be have implemented some type of system or software to take those people's jobs. You can think I'm playing. You can think I'm laughing. You see it right now. How many of us, how many of us, when we first saw, watch, y'all about to laugh. Y'all about to laugh. How many of us, when we first got across self-checkout, we ran up a bag? You know you had about $150 worth of stuff in that basket that you only paid $52 for. It's okay. I'm not asking you to raise your hand because I don't want you to incriminate yourself. I don't know what's the length of that. You know, I don't know what's the length of that. But what I do know is this. As they started adjusting, as they started adjusting security, you stop hitting that self-checkout as much. You went from 10 items to one. And then you look to make sure you hit that one item. But then we saw they went from one machine to two machines. From two machines to four machines. From four machines to eight machines to only one person working at cash cashier's desk. Some place you go to, there's nobody on the rug. They just got a security guard. Or there's one person to walk around. Like, if you go to Whole Foods, there's one person on the side, and she's just with you in case the barcode don't work. If you do not learn how to adjust, you anger yourself to poverty. One of my favorite things, one of the biggest things we've seen when it comes to adjusting was 
If you watch Hidden Figures, it's one of my, one of my favorite movies to watch. When the copy machine and the Xerox machine was created, you saw her paying attention. She went and read all the books she could read. And when the so-called professionals couldn't get it, she brought her people in there, and they was running it. Dee, 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 dee. All the white women looking at her like she crazy. Guess what they had to do? Learn from her. She adjusted. Some of y'all, y'all ain't adjust. You ain't learn from the pandemic. You ain't learn that job security is false security. All right, I ain't gonna drag on it no more. Let's go. <sighs> Apple is becoming one of the strongest companies in the world every day. Just recently, we, we are watching them become fight for vertical integration. If you don't know what that means, that means a company that produces everything upon itself. They fighting for it. That means they don't have to outsource nothing. First they said, listen, we getting rid of Intel. Gone. Intel took a hit. They've been trying their best to get rid of Qualcomm. It's just, sometimes it's just hard to duplicate. But look what they came out and said. By 2024, we'll be, rid of, we'll be out of Qualcomm. And by 2025, we'll be out of Broadcom. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Right here on the screen, here are companies that de depend heavily on Apple. Here are companies that depend heavily on Apple. What do you think, for what do you think happens to a company that 30% of their revenue is coming from Apple and Apple says, hey, yo, we good? What do you think happens to that company? There's something that happens to that company. I want you to be mindful of this, y'all. When you're investing in the company, I want you to look at the ecosystem that that company consists of. And then I want you to pay attention to how much revenue in that company is coming from one company. No matter how good the company balance sheet is, no matter how good the company management team is, if a company has an overweight amount of revenue coming from one company, I do not want you to make that your primary position in your portfolio. That's some game for y'all. Bro, I be, hey. How you feel? Mar, you feel like we kick, we, we kicking, we, we spitting over here? There you go. I like it, man. My brother say he taking notes. That's what I'm talking about. All right, let's go a little further. Let's go a little further. Watch this. The beef is still beefing. So we thought, yeah, they got some pretty teeth, man. Hey, man. Damn. All right. One of my favorite, so I like to, as I've become a great in investor, and as I've become, the reason why I love the stock market so much, man, is because it has made me aware of the world. It has made me aware of how the world, it, it made me aware of how billionaires beef with each other. I love it. I love watching billionaires beef with each other because it's not about killing you. It's about financially bankrupting you, digging into your revenue. I love to see it because it lets me know that business is a violent game. But it's a game only for a chosen few. True enough, you can say, my only competition is me. You are lying to yourself. There's a piece of the pie for everybody. Somebody wants the majority stake. How you think about that, Marks? 
People are like, I'm my only competition. That's true. You got to be better than the best version of you. But I want you to know something. Somebody wants the majority share. Somebody wants the majority share. Some, some. McDonald's know that McDonald's is the only competition, but it wants more burger sold than Burger King. Nike is the dominant player in the game. But when and one was on a rise, McDonald's, and Nike said, wait a minute, they are bringing a different part of the culture to the tennis shoe industry. And then what did Nike do? They came out with an A1 commercial that was better than an A1, and they put better people in it. They put more money behind it, and they made A1. That was the beginning of the end to A1. Little Curry had Jason Wood, uh uh uh, throwing the ball right here, uh 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 uh, uh throwing the ball behind their back. Remember, that was, that was the whole A1 style. Nike said, wait a minute, they selling more shoes than us right now? They, sell, they got more of the culture, the tennis shoe culture than us right now? Uh-uh. We the big dog. They went spent spent $100 million on a commercial. And one shoes went downhill. Brrr, that was the beginning of the end. All it takes is one good commercial. They went hard. I'm talking about they had a do do that. They had all the big-time basketball players. Uh-uh. They behind the back. They had everybody. Beginning of the end. Somebody wants to be big dog. And I don't care what nobody say. So watch this. My favorite beef to watch right now is Apple and Facebook. And as of right now, I'm going to keep it real. Tim Cook is cooking Mark. He cooking it. He, he cooking it. But Mark is fighting. Mark Zuckerberg is fighting. He, he fighting. The stock is up this year. But watch this. As of right now, Mark Zuckerberg has the lead when it comes to the AR, VR, metaverse thing. Apple said, not on my watch. Apple has now estimated they have 171 users. I mean... Augmented reality, AR, VR reality, has, the metaverse has 171 million users. As of 2022, the VR gaming system is worth $12 billion. 25 to 34-year-olds have the accounts, which makes up 23% of the devices. Watch this. Apple said by middle of the year, we will drop our AR, VR glasses between the range of $15,000 and $3,000. Let's go a little further. The thing about that is they are now going to take a piece of the pie from Facebook. Everybody thought that Mark Zuckerberg was crazy. You're betting all of this money on a version of the world that we do not know will exist. The problem with people is, watch this, the problem with people is it is hard for most people to see the future because the comfort of right now feels too good. No one likes change. If once, I can tell you right now why people don't like change. Instagram right now has changed the way people see pictures, Reels, pictures are down to non-existent. It don't even, if you're an entrepreneur, you ain't even posting pictures no more. You posting tweets and reels. That's what you posting. The only people posting pictures is like people who don't really have business like talking about it. And 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 I'm not gonna say it. Fleshly people, people showing the flesh, Lashana. I'm being I'm saying I'm sanctified. I'm sanctified. I'm sanctified. So, so, so sanctified. I'm being good because my right hand up in here. She works with Eric Thomas. We already know E.T. don't play. Lashana, you got to get from over there by trap. He talking about buns. You think, you talk, what do you think Dee going to say about this? E, she in good hands, brother. She in good hands. CJ, if you watching, she in good hands, brother. She in good hands. Carl, she's in good hands. Tobe, she's in good hands. 
<laughs> All right, so check it out. Honestly, if you're an entrepreneur, if you have a business right now, posting pictures on Instagram is not really doing you no justice. It's not getting your information out there where you want it. But here's what's happening. People who have entrepreneurs who are not getting their real scene like they want, instead of them making the adjustments, guess what they're saying? Man, why Instagram shadow banning me? Then people ain't shadow ban you, bro. They just switch the algorithm up on you. You got to adjust. One thing we do over here, we shoot six, seven different types of content. Let's see which one going to hit, fam. People don't like change. What Apple has done is Apple say, yo, watch this. Yep, y'all thought, y'all thought Mark was crazy. He ain't crazy because we're going to enter the game too. And what we do know is Tim Cook ain't wasting no money on producing a product that he don't think is the future. Now, here's the problem. You 35, you 40, you 29, you don't think this cool. Guess what? You're not their target audience. You are not their target audience. Guess who this AI for? Guess who these glasses for? The 17-year-old, the 18-year-old, the 22-year-old, the TikToker. That's who this is for. That's who this is for. You're not the audience that they're targeting. They don't care if you don't watch it. Why? Because you're still probably on Facebook. Oh, it is too heavy. Well, because you, you, your neck old. You can't even hold the thing up long enough. They're not worried about you. They want the young neck. Pause. Only because Jose in here. You feel me? So let's move a little further. Let's go a little further. Y'all know I do these little rants here and there, man. Right? Now watch this. The price tag is going to be anywhere between $1,500 and $3,000. Again, you may not be the audience, but guess what you're going to do? You're going, you're going to buy it for your kid. I'm keeping it real. Everybody thought Mark Zuckerberg was crazy when he said, I'm upping the price on Quest 2 from 900 to 1500 Everybody said, man, he tripping. Apple said, we're coming out at 1500 to 3000 somewhere in that price range. And if I know Apple like I know Apple, it's probably going to be 2450 that's a mark my word, Jose. $24.50. But Apple know one thing. This is the future. This is the future. Let's go a little further. So I want to give you all a demonstration. Here's the metaverse market. From 2020, 15 billion, 2021. 17 billion, it is expected to increase 35, almost 40% between now and 2030. Question, I'm not a mathematician, so I won't even try to do it on air like I am. 40% plus 17 billion, you write the numbers, you do the numbers and then you tag me on Instagram and say, trap, here's the number and I'm going to share it. We're talking about a market. We're not saying it's going to be a dominant market, but here's what we do know. Here's the one thing we cannot deny. Once America and the world adapts to the metaverse, it now becomes an entirely new market full of new solutions. It becomes full of new solutions. This now breeds or gives birth to what? New solutions, new industries. You're going to see trap at the Wall Street looks like us now, complex, in the metaverse. Trap and Tuesdays will be in the metaverse. It is what it is. I probably won't be teaching. Maybe my daughter will because she's going to have to teach your children how to get money. I'm not mad at it. I'm not even going to fight it. His thing. Make sure you got your gear on. Make sure you're repping the brand. Young Trappers Unite or something. Trappers R Us or something. Trapping like my daddy. Trapping like my daddy. Trapping like my daddy. Trapping like my daddy. I like that. We might have copyright that. Trapping like my daddy. 
All right, let's go a little further. Here's what I want you to see. Here's some of the industries that we'll be into. We're talking about uh, companies like Roblox, companies like Logitech, companies like uh, Diamondback, companies like Samsung, Microsoft, PayPal, Apple. Biggest companies in the world are going to be in the metaverse. Yo, I told you, listen, I paid $40,000 for some metaverse property. What were you at, Lashana? Why did you let me do something like that? I spent forty thousand dollars, bro, next for some metaverse property next to Atari. I did. I felt like it was prime real estate. In my mind, I said, "Man, that's Atari. I'm about to buy that thing." That was like buying a duplex on Boardwalk. That what I felt. I can't sell it at this point. I'm stuck. I'm not selling it. People offer, people offer me to buy it every day. I'm not selling it, though. Especially now that Apple just bought bringing them glasses out. I will not. I will not sell. I'm going down like Jack. Rose, just let me share the boat. Let me share the board, Rose. Let's go, man. Moving on. How y'all feeling tonight, man? Two day. Give me a two day. Let me get the beat for about five seconds, Tootie. Just five seconds. Let me get it. Let me get a little bit. One, two. Hey, yo, in the chat right quick, let's judge Tootie beat. Let's judge Tootie beat. Let's judge Tootie beat. Let's go, Tootie. Let me hear Brother Tootie on the track, man. I felt like we need to give Tootie his applause, man. Everybody in the chat. Man, smash the like button for me for a second. Jose, we freezing up a little bit. We got up to 2,100, and before I could have said it, it went back down to 16. I mean, we froze. Shout out to my brother Tootie on the track, man. Um, let's just get the likes up to 1,000, y'all. Tootie on the track, man. We appreciate that. Yep, we definitely freezing Jose because it was at 2100 and it went all the way down to 14. That means we freezing. That's how I know we freeze. Anytime we have a, mastic, a drastic fall like that, that means it froze up. You know, we, we only got short attention span. Freeze, we leave. This shit cheap. <laughs> what they say. All right, man, let's go a little further. Yep, it's freezing, I said. All right, man, let's go a little further, man. How y'all feeling tonight? Let's get the likes up to 1,000. I appreciate y'all. Let's get the likes up to 1,000. I appreciate y'all. Let's get the likes up to 1,000. Shout out to 1,000 likes, man. Let's give it up for that. We love it. 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 We appreciate y'all. All right, so let's go inside the streaming for a second. Damn. I forgot my... Hey, do you see my green phone over there? I got something for y'all, man. I, I apologize. I apologize. Do we see my green phone? I apologize, y'all. Oh, Dave, come here for a second. I apologize, y'all. I forgot to give y'all the recession, re, uh, recession thing, man. My bad. Yeah, man, my bad. I'm about to eat, uh, mail drop you this. So, Marcus, every week, 
Let me show the importance of this, Marcus. So every week, so I was one of the only, probably the only, I'm not going to say it because nobody else ain't do it. You were one, two, five, one, six. So last year the stock market was down. In 2022, the stock market was down um, 18%. No. Yep, so the S&P was down. Um, the S&P was down, I don't know. Uh, all right, Dave, I'm about to see this, Dave. Dave, if you put my if you put my number on there, I'm a hundred out. Yeah, add it in there if you want. You're gonna be playing them heavy calls when you go to that church. <laughs> you got it? All right, cool. So every week, man, so the stock market, the stock market, the SP 500 was down last year um, 19%. We beat the S&P by, we was a positive 17% on a year, which is not easy to do, which means we beat the pros, we beat 90% of the pros. We show that portfolio every week now to show people what we're doing, what we're not doing, but also so that Travis can know that we are legit. I feel like we are in a stage and we're in an arena where anybody now can say what they're doing, but our people and the people, and when I say our people, I mean people who are coming from poverty, people who are coming from middle class, who are striving to just build wealth and attain wealth, I feel like they need more than words right now. They need proof. So every week we show them the recession portfolio. Can we show Jose, can we show him the recession portfolio uh, thumbnail? We got to give them the whole experience. We got to give them the whole experience. And then after we give you this, ah, recession portfolio. Traps, so this segment is called Traps Recession Portfolio. It's brought to you by none other than Trap is Anonymous. Trap is Anonymous is an amazing community for those who are dedicated to learn how to build wealth. If you truly want to learn how to build legacy, if you truly want to learn how to navigate the stock market, come join the group. We do daily activities Monday through Sunday. On Sundays, we do two-hour classes on live, and on Thursdays, we have book clubs. The goal is to help you build your confidence. The goal is to help you be around a community of like-minded people who are truly on the same journey you are. So even if you're at the beginner stage, we have enough beginners to help you feel confident. If you're in the intermediate stage, we've got enough intermediate level investors that make you feel confident. Not only just myself, but other lieutenants like Lieutenant Casey, Lieutenant Paul, Lieutenant Ashley, Lieutenant Lala, and Lieutenant Jabari. Our whole goal is to make you a better investor. So come join us. It is $47 a month. Here's the recession portfolio, y'all. Boom. So as of right now, going into this year, the recession portfolio is up 11%. All right. So um, our Exxon Mobil. Did $400 today. VTRX, y'all remember I told y'all that? Let me get up, let me show y'all. So we bought VTRX, we added this to the portfolio. Um, it has come alive. It has come alive, it's been run, it's been doing what we think it's gonna do. Uh, our grand total right now is 2,500. We haven't owned it long. It's the newest member to the trap. It's the newest member to the trap. Uh, we up 2,500 on it in about uh, and you can see this a new this is a new day, right? 124. This is about it. This is the end of the day. I just did it. This is real money, not fake money. Uh, today we did three thousand dollars on it. Total we up uh, eleven seven. I have sixty two thousand in cash. I will add about another. I will add probably about another fifty thousand in cash and another fifty sixty thousand in cash. I like to stay liquid. I, I like to have a being in cash is a position. Um, I will tell everybody that all of these gains are profit gains, not cash gains. These are profit gains. All right, so let's see. Um, so far, we have one out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven positions. We got one position down. Uh, ATKR is a new position I added. In case y'all don't want it, y'all want to see it. Um, we down eight eight hundred dollars and thirty six cents. We're not mad at that. 
Costco is up uh, $8,000. Today we lost $50 on it. Eli Lilly uh, is up $3,000. Lockheed Martin, the company that I love, I talk about defense, we up almost $6,000. TPL, this is company is actually the, 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 the catalyst to my portfolio. Uh, we up 28,000 here. VTRX, I'm going to tell you why I love this company. This company has, I'm going to tell you why I love this company. This company has, first of all, let me say this. I'm not a financial advisor. Any decision that you make when it comes to investment must be done based on your research and your research alone. If you cannot probably do the research, you need to go seek out that financial advisor. Your financial advisor can take you to glory. I can only take you to the trap house. <laughs> That's right, because listen, all we're going to do is... If you, go, if you rock with me, you'll never say this. I'm in a bind, Nate. Some other time. Some other time. I really need this money, man. Really but listen, check this out. Once you, still get, once you start getting money with Trap, this is what you got to tell people. Come on, I'm broke, baby. I ain't got no money. money. Boo. You hear me? <laughs> you got to tell them that. All right, so the reason why I love this company um, is because this company is about to change the game. Now, I'm not telling you when to get it. I'm saying I've been in it. I told y'all when I got in it. This company has a phase three drug that is a non-addictive opioid. Yeah, that was, don't tell me that was no blood, bro. That was no blood. Let me tell you the importance of that, in case y'all don't get it. Like, Trap, I don't understand that significance. Right now, they are treating opioid almost like they treated crack in 94. There is a war on opioid usage. Now, the difference is the war is on suburban kids because that's who, that's what made them consider this a war. Same reason why Nancy Reagan said, just say no. Because then the suburban kids start smoking crack. Once they start sitting like their mama Dooney and Burke, it became a problem. Same thing happening right here. This opioid is bad. If this company is in phase three, why is phase three so important? Because once a company goes from phase three to phase four, that means it is ready for human consumption. That's a gem. If you're in the biopharmaceutical company, industry, or if you're in the industry of any person or any company that makes medicine, once they go from phase three, if you get a company that got a product in phase three, that is extremely good because it is now ready for human consumption. This company is the only company, it has a patent on it, that it will put an opioid drug. If you don't know what an opioid is, it's a painkiller. It's a painkiller. Painkillers send off an emotion in the mind that is addictive because the body naturally wants to be in that relaxed state. That's why opioids are so Addictive. This company will release that drug. When this company releases that drug, it will unlock $30 billion in cash by itself. Ain't nobody gonna out research me, y'all. I pride myself in putting y'all in position to win. ExxonMobil is my other company. It is up 4600 
I will not have more than 10 companies in this portfolio. Why? Because it's extremely hard to beat the market with a bunch of companies. My goal is to beat the market. This is a game of returns. It is harder to beat the market with 50 and 60 and now you're an index fund. I don't want to be an index fund. I am an individual investor. I'm not telling nobody to buy this company. If the company start going down, do not tag me and say, trap, I'm broke because of you. Nope, you're not. You're not. Trap, you told me to put my money right here. I lost my money because of you. Nope, you didn't. I told you, don't invest in this company because you ain't getting it. Here's what I want you to understand. A good company is not a good investment if you get it at the wrong time. I just flamed your ass. It's nothing. <laughs> I just flamed you just now. All right? I want you to understand. So here's, so Marcus, this is the recession portfolio, bro. We're doing pretty good, man. You know, we up about 51,000 in it. We got 62,000 sitting on the side. All dividends are reinvested. We're going for another year whooping the market ass. All right, was, uh, Dave, let's get back to... Uh, Let's get back to our regular schedule program. All right. Let's go inside the stream awards, y'all. So the reason why this is important for me, man, because I want us to look at something. And, and I, I, had a, I had a conversation on Instagram the other day. Dave, I'm seeing you this one. I just want to show y'all inside the numbers, y'all. That's all I be wanting to do. I be... One thing I like to do is show y'all inside the numbers on Trapping Tools, man. I know Tootie about to come in a minute and tell me I'm tripping. But about to show y'all inside the numbers today. Jose, I mean, uh, Dave, I'm sending you this. Dave, you put my uh, information out there. We're going to have to do a GoFundMe. You got it? No? Okay. Run that up, Dave. One more time. Uh, one more time before we go. Uh, I got to show you all this, too, before we go. Before we go back to our regular schedule program. LaShana, how you feeling? You like the show so far? All right, cool. Got to make sure my team like the show. Let me know when you're ready, Dave. Ten seconds. All right, cool. Do me a favor before we get into these ten seconds. Like it. I see we got 1,100 people that likes. Shout out to 1,100 people. We flaming. We cooking tonight. You dig? And let's clap. <laughs> all right, good job, man. So I want to show y'all this right quick so y'all can also see. Uh, y'all can see what we did. So this is the, um, the options portfolio. Uh, so far, we got three positions in. Uh... So I want to show y'all something. So y'all remember when we did this Netflix call? So remember when I told y'all, I said, listen, man, I was supposed to get in this Netflix call when it was 260. Remember we talked about it, right? I waited until I found my opportunity again, Sean. I waited. I found my opportunity to get it. It went down 8%. In one day last week, right? And then the day after that, earnings was coming up, and I made my estimate. So two things have aligned for me. One, I was able to get the option at a cheap price, which is what I wanted, and I had an idea on what was going to happen with earnings. Now, it wasn't because I thought that they were naturally going to beat earnings. What I thought was because they added, see, I, I let the data dictate that what I did. I never make emotional decisions. And I talked to y'all about it. I, I let the data put the information in front of me. So the data said that Netflix had added more, more subscribers based on bringing in the ad revenue, which means they had a cheaper model. I think it was $4.99 or $6.99. But that tier came with ads. Because we were in the environment we were in, People are willing to spend $4.99. So those people came back to Netflix. I, 
I figured that. Now, I did think it was going to be an increase in money, but it wasn't. They missed earnings, but they added 4 million subscribers. The dope part about that was this. Netflix was still profitable, but what made the 4 million subscribers amazing was Netflix said this. It wasn't just the 4 million subscribers. The 4 million subscribers is one thing, but then they said this. We're going to find a way, watch this, to make the people who are sharing the password pay us a low price. And that's all Wall Street wanted to know. Because Netflix has a problem with sharing passwords. They say, all right, cool. We know we got the people sharing passwords. All we need to do though is find out how to make them at least pay us two or three dollars. If we can get half the people who are sharing passwords to pay us four dollars or one ninety nine or two ninety nine, we're okay with that. Wall Street said, bad. Wall Street said, run it up. So I put the call in. I put a three thirty call in for September 15, 2023. So it's not, a, it's not long. We put that in last week. As of this week, one week, we've made $21,669. Today alone, we did 6%. In total, we, have, we are up 42.67%. I'm going to probably leave this call... I don't want to hold it to September, June, July. I want to exit this in June. My goal is to exit this in June. But if I see the market going another way, I'll exit fast. Understanding my exit strategy. That's called risk management. My goal is to get up 150%. That's my goal. Once I get 100%, I want to take my principal money out which means whatever I think I spent $60,000 on this, I want to take my principal money out, or did I spend $40,000? Something like that, yep. Spent 50, yep, right about $50,000. So I want to take my principal out. Once I take my principal out, that means I'm taking what I paid for it back. I'm going to put that on the side, and I'll just play with house money. It's the nature of the game for me. All right, XLC. Now, this one kind of made me mad. This one is down. So this XLC is the communication and streaming service in uh, ETF. This is down because of Google. This is down because of Google. The number one position in this ETF is Facebook, 23%. The number two position in this ETF is Google at 11%. The number three position in this ETF is Google at 11%. So it has Google A and Google C. So Google has Class A shares and Class C shares. This is why this thing is down 11%, because today Google got a notice that they are being charged by the Department of Justice for antitrust laws. Everything else is doing pretty good in this ETF, but because it's number two and number three position is 11% apiece, That means in total, this one position is equal to 22% of this ETF. If anything in the ETF at 22% moves, the ETF is going to fall that way. Does that make sense? God damn. (laughs) That boy is good. Mm -hmm. Good, terrible. Listen, I told y'all earlier, when you're looking at an ETF, if you understand what's inside of the ETF, you can understand what makes the ETF move. It's simple. It's dissecting the ETF. I told y'all, look at the top 10 holdings, right? So I told you off the top of my head what the top 10 holdings was. Facebook at 23%, and you can go fact check me. Facebook at 23%, Google A at 11.7%, Google C at 11.4%, uh, Netflix at 4%, uh, Character Communications at 4%, Comcast at 4%, Warner Brothers at 4%, Disney at 4%, Verizon at 4%, at t at 4%. That's what's in the top eight or nine positions. Google is what took this down. Nothing else was that big. But 
even at 11%, I was almost, I was at 75%, bro. I was at my 75%. Now, I got to watch this. Why do I got to watch this? I got to see how the market is responding to Google over the next couple days. Because of the lawsuit, now Google did fight back. But I got to see how the market responds to Google over the next couple days because 11% today cost me a couple thousand dollars. It cost me a couple thousand dollars. This could have easily been $40,000 right here. Now, as you can see, I'm over my 50% mark. But $11,000, I can, I can easily say this cost me a couple thousand dollars. And lastly, my XLE, we up 106%, but I've been in this since about October, maybe November, I'm lying. November, I had, in total, I had 100 and, I had, uh, I'm sorry, I had 75 shares. I, right now, I done sold 27 of those shares. So I'm playing with house money right here. So as you can see, the portfolio is up 62%. Today, we lost $6,000, and that come from here. We lost $6,000 today. That came from there. All right. All right, Dad, let's get back to our regular schedule program. So this is my portfolio. Wanted to let y'all see it. I got you, too. I appreciate you. All right, man, so let's get into it. Inside the streaming world, man, Netflix has represents 91% minutes of streaming time. Um, HBO Max represents 5%. Disney represents 2%, Amazon 2%, Peacock 1%. So that tells us right now in Q4, Netflix is dominating watch time when it comes to streaming. Let's move on. Where are my papers at? All right. Here we go, man. I believe that we all should own defense as well. I think you should own at least one stock in the defensive sector. Why? Because no matter who's in office, no matter who's in office, America will spend money on defense. Lockheed Martin CEO came out today and said they do expect slow growth for 2023, but more explosive growth for 2024 and 2025. They have a back order of over $150 billion in aircraft. They also are developing ballistic missiles. That's right. That's the missile somebody shoot in the air. They can catch the missiles. They have 147 to 155 aircraft in the making for next year and for 2025. I personally believe in the defensive sector. I believe defense and I believe healthcare is something that everybody should own. Let's go a little further, man. Raytheon uh, is another defensive stock. The stock has a $16 billion buyback that reported today. The company actually has big dividends and Boeing is up 10% just in 2023 alone. If you want access to any of these or all of these together, you can buy the ETF ITA. It's an iShares ETF. It'll give you access to Raytheon. It'll give you access to Boeing. And it'll give you access to Lockheed Martin. It also has Northern Grumman in it. Let's go, man. I like to call this needle money. <laughs> we like to call this legal money, needle money. Shout out to my guy, Steve, man. The reason why we call this needle money is because, man, Moderna has an RSV vaccine, and it is good for adults above 60. It is 84% effective, and it is in phase three. It's well tolerated. No safety concerns have been identified. Plans to submit it for regulatory approval in the first half of the year. Why do I call this needle money? Well, because I personally believe that needle vaccines will now be the way that a lot of new healthcare companies will make money. I'm gonna just tell you, be mindful of taking those vaccines because once it go in you, it's hard to get it out you. Take that how you want it. <laughs> Let's go a little further. Let's go a little further. Watch this though. Pfizer, and this is why I call the needle money. The RSV vaccine market for adults is from a $7 billion to a $10 billion industry between now and 2030. Needle money. Pfizer, GSK, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, and Norvac have all put in to have these forms of vaccines in place. 
Pfizer could launch one late this year. GSK could launch one late this year. Moderna is launching another one in 2024. Johnson & Johnson has one in phase three. And Nordic has one in phase three as well. I'm just saying, I just pay attention to where they're putting the money at. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to invest in any of these. What I am saying is always pay attention to what's going on and what navigate. I will say this. As an investor, only invest in things that morally fit you. There isn't such thing as moral investing. I would never invest in a prison because I don't believe in prison stock. Some people would never invest. I would never invest in Johnson & Johnson because I know for a fact they got people with cancer and they did that purposely. I would never invest in uh, the company that we cut. <laughs> Forgot the name of the company. But Monsanto would never invest in that company. Will never invest in that company. That's right, Z. Eat right, exercise right, go on, take care of yourself. Shout out to my girl, Ashana, man. She is on her fitness journey, and she will pay me $15 every time she does not go to the gym. Let's go. Moving on. Let's go, man. How y'all enjoy y'all shots tonight, man? It's been a good night, man. Fintech, 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 fintech. I love fintech. Big banks now have entered the fintech space. Wells Fargo, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, and four other banks have come up with plans to put out a digital wallet. The digital wallet will take on people like Apple. It will take on people like PayPal. It will take on all other fintech companies. Well, Mr. Trapper, Wall Street Trapper, you said last year that you love fintech. And Mr. Trapper, the fintech industry has been getting its butt whipped. Yes, I do know, but I am bold enough to bet on the future. I told everyone that that has to be a four- to five-year play because the way we use money will change. The way we use money is changing. The issue behind this is, can the banks put the right technology in place right now? We've already seen companies like Wells Fargo and Bank of America struggle with technology. Let's go a little further. Here's the crazy part, though, y'all. When we think about the other four banks that's owning this, that's part of this, right? The company that will be housing the digital wallet is the same company that is called Early Warning System, EWS. This is the same company that operates all transfers for Zelle. That's right. When you Zelle somebody some money, when you Zelle somebody some money, there's a company that actually is responsible for those things. Watch this. Let's go a little further, y'all. Show you how deep this is. So they said there's four other banks that have part of this, right? Capital One, Truist. U.S. Bank Corp. and PNC Bank, these are the four banks that own EWS. Here's what I want to understand. If fintech, if fintech wasn't a threat, why would all the big banks come together and say, yo, we have to create our own digital wallet? That way when customers and our customers go to the shopping center, when they go to the movie, they can simply say, hey, I'm with Wells Fargo, I'm with Bank of America, I'm with PNC, I'm with Trust, I'm with J.P. Morgan Chase. Why is this possible? Why is this happening? You only come up with a product when you feel like what you have and what you're doing is being threatened. Technology and new technology threatens every industry in the world. No one is exempt. No one is exempt. I will stand on it firmly. I will buy me some more PayPal. I will buy me some more of these digital fintech companies because fintech will definitely change the game. I'm not telling you to do it, but I personally will buy it. Let's go. <laughs> Luxury goods are making a comeback, man. Listen, LVMH is up 18% year to date. We also got companies like Burberry, Tapestry, Hermes, and Karen Group. All of these are foreign um, stocks on a foreign exchange. Not on the foreign, on the European market, they are all up 13% year to date. Luxury goods is making a comeback. So my question is, is the consumer back in a good state? I don't know. All right, let's go a little further, man. All right, man. So y'all know that this part is called learning the lingo. This part of the show is always dedicated to teaching trappers how to invest by learning the lingo. The reason why most people don't invest, the reason why people, a lot of people stop investing is because they don't understand what they're investing in. Learning the lingo is dedicated to helping you understand exactly what it is that's going on. 
This week's Learn of the Lingo is market cap, the total value of a publicly traded company of outstanding common shares owned by stockholders. Market capitalization is equal to the market price per common share multiplied by the number of common shares outstanding. Let me just make it simple for you. It's definitions like that why you personally don't understand what market cap is. Market cap is simple. Outstanding shares mean the number of shares that a company has times the stock price give you the market cap. I'll give you an example. I'll even make it simple for you. If I had 10 shares and each one of my shares were worth $100, then my market cap is how much? Let me see it in the chat. If my company had 10 shares and that's it, and each share was worth $100 a piece, how much would my market cap be? If you said $1,000, you got it right. But watch this. A company's market cap can increase and decrease. Watch this. If I had 10 shares still and then my market cap went up to $200, what would my market cap be then? $2,000. Market cap goes up and goes down based on the stock price. Stock price time outstanding shares gives you a company's market cap. So when you hear what a company's market cap, understand that it is simply one thing. Stock price times outstanding shares give you the market cap. This definition that they give you, the total value of a publicly traded company's outstanding shares owned by stockholders, market capitalization is equal to the market cap price per common share multiplied by the number of common shares outstanding. I can promise you most people read that and say, man, I'm not even doing that shit. But as a trapper, we just simplified it. And that is the importance of trapping too. Let's go, y'all. Well, hey, uh, before we do breaking out of break, can we get a commercial, please? He sent it to you? Let's get a commercial right quick, y'all. Two, two minute commercial? Two minute commercial? Let's get it. What's good, trappers, man? It's your boy, the Wall Street Trapper. Right now, I want to invite you to an amazing experience full of value. That is my community, Trappers Anonymous. It's 100% the greatest fundamental investing community on the market. Listen, your portfolio should be a masterpiece. And the only way we get you there is if we help you to learn how to invest with confidence. Now listen, I get it. Like you don't know a lot about stocks or maybe you've heard people say how much money they lost in stocks, but I can guarantee you one, because they weren't in the community and two, they lacked the information. Our goal in Travels Anonymous is to help you, really to hold your hand on the journey to becoming a confident investor, learning how to navigate through the different events that the stock market goes through to bring your temperament down, to take you from panic to encouragement. So listen, man, come join us in Trappers Anonymous. The link is below. Listen, if you want to be helped, if you want to truly make money in the stock market, if you truly want to let your money work harder for you than you've worked for it, there's no better time than now. This is an opportunity only for those who are willing to be on the journey. So listen, man, click the link below. Come join me in Travis Anonymous, man. I will see you in one of our mini classes, whether it's Moat Monday, whether it's the two-hour class we do on Sunday, or whether it's just the book club. Everything is geared toward making you a better investor so you can triple your network and turn your last name to an asset. It's your boy, Wall Street Traveler. See you in the trap. Let's give it up for the commercial, man. We stepping our game up. We stepping our game up, man. Let's give it up for the commercial one more time. Let's go, man. Welcome to Trapping Tuesdays, man. We appreciate you. If you join Trappers Anonymous, welcome to the family. I will probably see you tomorrow morning. Let's go, man. This segment is brought to you by none other than Trappers Anonymous, commercial you just seen, man. Listen, man, Breaking Down a Brick is an amazing segment that we use to show you a company. Sometimes you may know the company, sometimes you may not know the company. The golden objective is to show you different companies that you can see, use, and understand. This week's Breaking Down a Brick is none other than, drum roll please, Kimberly and Clark, man, this is a great company, right? This is a long company that's been out for a while. Scotch tissue paper, cotton all, huggies, uh, baby huggies. Uh, we got the pull-ups, we got the cleaners, we got the Kleenex. We got them. Whoa, there's man diapers? Yeah. 
I didn't know they had men diapers, though. Sometimes it's good to just be quiet for a second. You never know nobody's situation, man. All right, so let's go a little further, man. So listen, when we look at Kimberly Clark, uh, the industry average, we're talking about P.E. ratio, is 32.8. Uh, we can see right now that Kimberly and Clark is probably at around 26.2, which means it's actually cheaper than the industry average. But it is still expensive compared to the S&P 500. Let's go a little further. Let's go a little further. Um, here's the financial health of the company. The current P.E. rate. Current ratio is 0 0.78. That means we don't like the financial stability. Debt to equity ratio is 2.68, meaning they have more equity compared to debt, debt to EBITDA. Interest coverage ratio is 9.2, which means that the company can do what? The company can pay off its debt. Debt servicing ratio means the company can service its debt at 15.4. We like those things. Here's the company total equity. Here's the company total debt. We're not mad at that at all. Short cash flow, we see that right here. We're not mad at Kimberly and Clark. Let's move a little further. So let's just break some things down. Return on, return on equity is consistently at 12 to 15 percent year over year for the last five years. No, that's an issue for us to look at. Return on invested capital consistently at 12.15, 12% to 15% over year over year for the last five years, inconsistent. So that means the return on equity and the return on invested capital is inconsistent. Return on invested capital is usually around 14.78%. The WAC, if you're a trap master, you know what this means, uh, it's 4.37%. That is how we looked at the effectiveness of Kimberly and Clark. Let's go a little further, man. Let's look at it, man. Revenue growth year over year, five years consistently, yes. Net revenue, net income growing year over year for the past five years, inconsistent. Cash flow from operating activities growing year over year, inconsistent. Free cash flow positive for the past five years, yes. Gross margin percent is consistent growing for the last five years, inconsistent. EPS growing for the past five years, inconsistent. Consistent. Performance. Revenue growing for the last five years, yes. Net income, inconsistent. Cash flow, inconsistent. We see it. free cash flow is important for us, man. Uh, gross margin is consistent. Growing for the last five years, inconsistent. Growing EPS for the past five years is inconsistent. This gives us a quick look at a company that we can look at. Let's go a little further, man. I'm not telling you to invest in that company at all. All I'm saying is I'm just giving you a fundamental analysis breakdown on the company. You do your own homework. That is why we called it breaking down a brick. Shout out to my guy Zay in the chat. That means Zay know we just gave y'all some game just now. All right, man, let's go a little further, man. This segment is one of my favorite segments. It is the Certified Trap of the Week. I started doing this segment because we talked about Warren Buffett and a lot of great investors that's always talked about. But I said to myself, you know what, there's so many people that look like me, sound like me, talk like me, that are responsible for me being here. That is responsible for me being here. I decided to highlight them for, for 27 weeks consistently. We've given y'all some game. And I'm going to tell y'all something. It ain't easy to find. It is not easy to find. I'll be having to dig. All right, let's go, man. This week, we're going to talk about an amazing, amazing black man and black woman that goes by the name of, drum roll please, Charles and Laura Douglas. They had the first resort, black resort ever. Highland Beach, incorporated in 1922, founded by, in 1893, by Charles and Laura Douglas. Right, Highland Resort is one of the most prominent resorts, towns in Highland Beach in Maryland. Charles and Laura Douglas established in 1893 originally named Ardell on the Bay. Charles was the third youngest son of Frederick Douglass and a Civil War veteran who had bought Highland at, in Maryland after he was denied entry to the Bay Resort due to discrimination. Douglass began buying property on the beach. Once he bought the property, the next thing he did was he started selling it to other prominent black figures. Douglas also bought a house on a, he bought a house and became the first 
prominent black community in that area. Converted it to Highland Beach, it quickly became a prominent area for figures such as Alex, Alex Haley, W.D. Du Bois, Du Bois, Du Bois, Du Bois, and Paul Robinson. After he died, his son worked tirelessly to keep the beach alive, and it became, I got to say this real slow, an African-American incorporated municipality. I said it right. Municipality. Municipality. That boy good. <laughs> that boy is good. No hate. In the state of Maryland. Let's shout out to these, this man, this woman, this king, this queen. Let's shout out to them for having the first black-owned resort. That's big. That's before Disney. Might be before Disney. Hi, right, man. That's more or less first. So this is the this segment of the show is one of my favorite segments by far. It is called the Well Track. This one here, we going you know, for me, I, I love rap and I love hip hop so much. Um, I feel personally like the hip hop game, the industry is is an amazing industry. Um, but I feel like sometimes our artists get caught up in what will sell instead of, I'm not going to say instead of, I'm going to say they get caught up in what will sell and telling their life story. You can't be mad at hip-hop without being mad at the, watch this. You cannot be mad at hip-hop artists without being mad at the circumstances that created the music. You cannot be mad at hip-hop artists if not, if you can, if you not first being mad at the circumstances that created the music. Which means most artists are often just telling us what they see, what they've heard, what they've been around. Whether we like it or not, Nas never told us he was a gangster, but he gave us a music and an amazing song like looking out of my project window. He never told us he was a gangster. He never told us he was a killer. But he told us the visuals that he saw looking outside of his project window. The difference is nowadays we will call that person a studio gangster. We get mad at that person for telling us what they saw. A lot of the artists today, I'm not saying they're right or wrong. What I'm saying is they've given us verbal description of what they've seen. We've created an atmosphere where we've made them, we've pressured them in being a certain type of person. I see right now on a lot of blog sites, they are now highlighting black men that told on other black men. Now, I'm from the street, so I'm not going to even voice my opinion on that. But what I will say is there are so many other things that we can be highlighting. Why are we making a big deal to highlight if somebody told on somebody or not? Again, I'm from the streets, so I have my own personal opinion on how I feel about the situation. But what I will say is with everything that has gone on in the world, why is it that we are highlighting whether a black man told or not? Another thing that I don't like is why is it that black women and black men fight for who have suffered the most? Black women, I am the most disrespected person in America. Okay, black man, I am the most disrespected. So now we fight against each other to see who has inflicted the most trauma. We cannot be mad at hip-hop artists if we not first get mad at the situation and the environment that created the lyrics to begin with. The same people, and I will say that at one point, I was a person like, man, we can't do this, we can't do that. But I will also say that the same people who say that, you know, we got to blame the artists, we got to do this, will go to a club and hear the music and bob our head to it. I want to say right now that I apologize for every artist who I've ever said, bro, we got to stop making that music. I will say we got to first start condemning the environments that created that music. We got to first start condemning the environments that made that music acceptable. We got to start condemning the people who are pushing the music, who are benefiting off our black men and black women for creating this type of music. These are the people we have to condemn first before we start condemning our own. I'm not saying that we're going to have to take accountability, but what I can say is we got to Blame the people who put us in position and make us feel like this is the only way that we can eat. Once we start doing that, 
then we create a different environment. We cannot say the slave who ran away is, is, is horrendous. Uh, I'm going to make it even better. If the hunter only told the story, the lion would always be the most vicious person in the world. If the lion got to tell his story, we would see it from another perspective. As long as the hunter gets to tell the story, he can paint the picture of the lion because the lion can never defend itself. The minute the lion gets to tell his story, he can tell you why I bit his ass. Okay, so this version of the well track is brought to us by none other than, rest in peace, young Dove. He said something, he gave us something that was amazing. He simply said, I got tired of buying cars, I started buying property. Trap Ninja out here playing real life Monopoly, end quote. Say it again. I got tired of buying cars, then I started buying property. Trap Ninja out here playing real life Monopoly. I'm going to tell you why I love this. I love this, 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 these couple bars. I'm a firm believer that, <laughs> I'm going to say this. Jose might got to bleep this out. Sometimes we got to just get the nigga out of us. <laughs> How you feel about that, Jose? We all right? I can let that flow? I can let that flow? All right. Sometimes we just got to get the nigga out of us, man. Oh, you let me say it again? I say it again? Oh, God, damn, my bad. My bad, my bad, my bad, my bad. My bad. Sometimes we just got to get it out of us, man. Sometimes we just got to get it out of us, man. And to everybody, it's different. Right? You take, a, you take a young, you take a black man who's, who's been in poverty his whole life, who's suffered. Memphis is a heavy, is heavy in the streets. The first thing you do is start buying you some cars. Buy you some jewelry. You get that out of you. If you've been poor and you've been broke your whole life, you got to at least feel what it feel like. And I'm not saying, I'm not here to judge. I think the problem is we judge too much. I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't do that. Shut up. Yes, you would. But I will say is he made a great statement. I got tired of buying cars. Then I started buying property. That's an amazing switch. Trap Ninja out here playing real life Monopoly. I believe that everybody should learn at least once a month they should play Monopoly with their kids. I believe everybody, every family that has kids, once a month you should play Monopoly with your kids and teach them about the game. LaShawn, why you look like that? Okay. All right, man. So that was my thoughts on that. Let's bring y'all to this segment right here. It's called Wise Words from the Old G. So, this is an amazing show today. We had a great time. Tootie came out here two times and told me speed up. I was in my bag today. I felt like having fun. It happens sometimes. But, That's what we do this for. We do this because Trapping Tuesdays, to me, is fertilized. I love to do it. But I want to ask you this question. What does wealth mean to you? What does wealth look like to you? But most importantly, what has provoked you to seek out to attain wealth? It's like climbing Mount Everest, tallest mountain in the world. Very few people can say they have made it successfully, but many have died trying to overcome it.
the fatigue of consistently fighting for a dream that often seems insurmountable can sometimes take the possession of one's inner being. I want, you, I want you to listen to that. Sometimes the goal of achieving well can be insurmountable, meaning it seems like it's something that's too big to overcome. Some of us feel like every time I take two steps forward, I take two steps backwards. Some of us feel like every time we're trying to save some money, something comes up. A light bill got to be paid. An emergency comes up. The car breaks down. A phone bill is due. The task of building wealth can seem insurmountable. But on this journey, we have to transform and transition from being reactive to proactive. How do we attack life? How do we stop letting life attack us? How do we stop sitting back being conservative, saying I'm saving money? How do I say, you know what, instead of me saving it, I'm going to invest it? How do we be proactive towards life? How do we put ourselves in situations to accumulate knowledge and then apply the knowledge and start accumulating the knowledge just to take notes? <laughs> we got some professional note takers. I sit up here every week for two hours because I love it, because I enjoy it, but also because I know what freedom feels like. I know what freedom tastes like. I know what freedom smells like. It's an acquired taste. The thing is, I want everybody to feel it. I want everybody to smell it. And I want everybody to taste it. So for two hours, for two and a half hours, I get up here, but that's not counting the six days prior that I prepare for it. That's not accounting for every person in here that makes sure that this show gets to you in the best way we can. Because everybody here is about being the most impactful. You begin to see life through your experiences. What have your experiences, what picture has life painted for you? Do you have a Mona Lisa? Do you have a Picasso? What do you have if you looked at your life? Your experiences can also dilute your perspective. but your perspective can influence your intellect. Plan, implement, execute. When I say that my perspective can influence my intellect is me asking myself a simple question. When I'm put in a situation, what is my response to it? My response to it is predicated on how I see life, what I've been through in life, and then I ask myself, what are the consequences of that action? What is the consequences of commitment? Is it losing friends? Is it losing the people you're close to? Is it quitting a job? Is it unanchoring yourself from a toxic relationship? Is it seeing money different? Is it being lonely? What is the consequences of commitment? But if we also understand that our perspective influences our intellect and our experiences paint a vivid picture of our life, how can we then create a Basquiat? What is that vision? What does those colors look like? 
What does freedom look like, smell like, and taste like to you? We have to reset the boundaries because we cannot live in the parameters of what was. The parameters of what was can be a prison. The parameters of what was keeps us in the financially traumatic, toxic environment. We must redefine our lives. We must redefine our perspectives. We must redefine what we think wealth is. We must redefine who we are. It's your boy, the Wall Street Trapping Man. Thank you for tuning in another amazing week of Trapping Tuesdays. I'm going to see you next week. Same time. Same place. Same desk. Each and every Thursday at 5 o'clock, man, you can catch the audio experience of Trapping Tuesdays. Help us get those likes up. Help us get those downloads up. I promise you we are dedicated to the journey. We will not stop. We are 27 episodes in with 27,000 more to go. I promise y'all we are dedicated to revolutionizing the financial movement. We are the trappers. We are the financial revolutionaries. I love y'all. Good night.